So recently I played through a fan-made remake or a remaster of Tomb Raider 2, which is a demo by the way. This demo was actually remade from scratch in the Unreal Engine by just one person. If you want to check out my video on it, the link is in the description and I highly recommend you to check it out. Now after having played that demo, I started to look back on the Tomb Raider franchise and see which ones I've played and which ones I've missed. Then a friend of mine actually gifted me Lara Croft Temple of Osiris, which I had no idea even existed. Somehow this game went under my radar, so I decided to actually install it and see what the fuss is all about. And I have to say, Lara Croft Temple of Osiris is actually a surprisingly good game. Why is that? Well, let's talk about it. So what exactly is Lara Croft Temple of Osiris? What kind of game is it? Well, it's an action-adventure game based on an isometric format. This means that the camera is fixed on an angle and you basically overlook the entire field pretty much at all times. The game plays more or less the same way as the Diablo franchise, the Warcraft 3 franchise, or even Divinity Original Sin amongst other similar games. So Temple of Osiris was released in late December 2014, and now after having finished this game, I realize that it also has a prequel which came out four years before, which is called Clara Croft Guardians of the Light. And based on what I've seen, both of these games play very similar to each other. And since I enjoyed Temple of Osiris, hopefully I'll enjoy Guardians of the Light as well. And I hope to get that video out sometime soon, so make sure to subscribe. The game also features a co-op system where you can play with up to four people. And based off of the Steam reviews that I saw and multiple other reviews that I saw, the multiplayer co-op is actually very buggy. And so I decided to not bother with it and I actually played just a single player campaign. The other issue a lot of people have, including myself, is that while this game does have achievements on Steam and on the console trophies as well, there are achievements based off of that multiplayer aspect as well. So the problem is that this game is nowhere near as popular or the multiplayer is, I would actually say the multiplayer is dead. Well, good luck trying to find three other people to play such, you know, an older, such a niche game. And this is something that games in the modern era seriously need to stop doing. First of all, they need to stop adding multiplayer to pretty much everything. And if they are going to add a co-op, just don't add achievements for co-op. It's really not that complicated. Let's move on to the story because that's one of the good things about this game and definitely worth talking about. So what is the basic premise or the story of this game? Well, as the name implies with Temple of Osiris, obviously it takes place within Egypt and it's heavily based upon the ancient Egyptian mythology. I have to say that the overall story is, in my opinion, a quintessential Tomb Raider story. The story is simplistic, yet easy to follow and very easy to appreciate. And that is because the story, in my opinion, fits perfectly well within the Tomb Raider universe, especially if you've watched some of the older movies or you've played some of the older games. And the best part of the story is that it is entirely self-contained, so you don't need to have to watch or know about 50 hours worth of backstory just to understand what the hell is going on. So based off of that, what is the story about? I was actually going to explain the entire story, but honestly, the intro of the game does a much better job than I ever could, and it does all of that within just two minutes. So I'll leave you to watch it, and I'll see you after. In Egyptian mythology, the god king Osiris unified the kingdoms and ruled with wisdom and justice over the whole of Egypt until he was killed by his brother, the usurper Set. Osiris's wife, the goddess Isis, recovered her husband's lifeless body. Using the power within the staff of Osiris, she returned him to the world, but only long enough to conceive a son, Horus. When Set learned of her actions, he stole the staff and used its power to imprison Isis and Horus. Then he seized the reanimated form of Osiris, tore his body into pieces, and scattered them across the land until he ruled Egypt unopposed. As his kingdom declined, he descended to the underworld, Duat, in search of greater power. But Osiris alone possessed the power to return from Duat, and without the staff, Set found himself trapped for eternity 
The Temple of Osiris remained sealed for thousands of years until I discovered a way inside. But I was not alone. Carter Bell, a rising star in archaeology, was also in search of the staff. The lost staff of Osiris was inside. With our prize so close, the race was on. Carter, wait! Ha! Not this time, Croft. But it was too late. The staff was a trap, and the temple a prison. Carter and I were cursed. We owe you our thanks, travelers. You have freed us from our prison. But you are now marked for judgment. You do not have much time. Do what? The realm of the dead awaits. I am Isis, and this is my son, Horus. We are the last of the old gods who stood against Set. If you wish to live, we must escape this temple and find the pieces of Osiris. And that's literally it. The intro explains the backstory and the current story in a short and concise way. Now, of course, you'll experience more of the story as you play, but by this stage, you already know who the heroes are and who the villains are, and you kind of have a rougher idea of how you're going to go about defeating Set, which is really great because, you know, games like these don't really need to have overly complicated plots for people to enjoy. So now with the story out of the way, let's talk about the meat of the game, and that's the gameplay, the progression, and the combat. So the gameplay of this game actually surprised me the most as opposed to the graphics or even the story, which I do like by the way. The thing with isometric genre, you have two different types of games. You have your real-time strategy games and then you have your MOBA games. Now the main deal breaker for me in the gameplay, which is pretty much apparent in every single RTS game, is that you're all you're doing is overlooking a battlefield and you have like hundreds or maybe a thousand of these small units that basically do their own thing automatically. And all you're really doing is either creating new buildings or crafting something, and you're basically just an observer. That's really all there is to it. There is no individual player agency or character agency. And that's one of the reasons why I've always hated RTS games, and I probably always will. But when it comes to the MOBA style, that is something that I can actually get behind, because you actually control one character. You have all of your abilities at your disposal. And the only difference is that the camera is actually at an angle and you're basically overlooking the battlefield. Realistically, you can move the camera to a third person or a first person view and it will still play the same way as any other third person or first person game. And that's the level of control that I personally really like. And I've played games like Heroes of the Storm, Warcraft 3, and even Divinity 2 Original Sin. I've actually come to really enjoy those types of games. However, I think Temple of Osiris does a much better job. Why? Because I can control Lara Croft by using the keyboard. So you can move Lara by using your WASD keys, you can use a spacebar to jump, and you use your mouse to aim and shoot in whichever direction you are facing. And you can also use the right mouse button in order to dodge in whichever direction you are traveling. This level of individual control is much more suitable for my playstyle than sort of like the games where you just play the game with a mouse. Because honestly, I could literally play Warcraft 3 or even Divinity Original Sin with just a mouse and I never have to touch the keyboard, which I just find to be unbelievably boring. Now, having said all that, one of the issues that I have with the camera, at least in this game, that is not a problem in any other game that I have mentioned, is that the camera is fixed. You can't even zoom in or out. Now, while the game does automatically zoom in and out when it's needed, and it is satisfactory, I still would have preferred having more control on when to zoom in and out. Because in some cases where the tomb is relatively dark, it's kind of difficult to see where you're going or seeing the little clutter on the floor. So having the option to be able to zoom in and out would have been a much better way of handling it. Another problem with a fixed camera is that since you can't rotate it, you will have the issue of depth perception. So for example, you might have a gem that looks like it's in your path, but when you go in that direction, it's not actually there. It's actually floating in the air before you or behind you. So you have to actually backtrack a little bit and actually jump around in order to acquire that one gem. 
And that sort of problem of depth perception also extends to certain puzzles where you think you've jumped at the right time because based on the angle that you're looking at, it looks like you've jumped at the right time. But within the actual game space, you may have jumped a bit too early. And because of that, you will basically die in one hit. That's usually the deal with Tomb Raider games. If you fall into a trap, it's usually always a one-shot death. But overall, these problems are kind of minor, as I only really experienced them in only a handful of areas. So it's not really a big deal, but it's still something that I wanted to let people know about. Now, as part of the gameplay, you'll be spending most of your times in various tombs, because of course, the game is called Tomb Raider. I do want to commend the developers for actually having created a variety of different tombs in this game. Each of them are visually different, but they still keep the underlying art style the same, because it's based off of the ancient Egyptian mythology. You'll see plenty of wall paintings, architecture, and clutter that is heavily based off of that part of the world. Now for the main story, there's about 15 or I think 17 different tombs that you'll have to go through. Each of them took me roughly 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the complexity, and that also includes the story elements, the exploration, puzzle solving, and the combat as well. So I think these tombs strike a very good balance between someone who wants to have a bit of a casual experience, so they'll come in, maybe do one or even two tombs, and then leave the game satisfied. Or someone who's a bit more of a power gamer who comes in and basically finishes all of the tombs in one sitting. And that is because the main story of the game takes about 5 to 6 hours to complete. If you're trying to go for like that 100% completion, it might take you up to 10 hours based off of the few different averages that I have seen. So how do you get to a tomb? Well, once you start the game and you finish the intro cinematic, you'll start off in a tomb. And this area serves as your tutorial section. And once you finish, you will then reach this area called the Temple of Osiris. This area will serve as your main hub, where you'll be able to explore, find secrets, find more gems, do optional challenges, and find any other collectibles. One good thing I like about this game is that for you to know where you have to go for the story, there are no map markers or anything. Instead, there are statues of Osiris that are scattered all across the temple. And once you get close to one, they will then activate and point you in whatever direction you're supposed to go which is a very immersive way of actually telling the player where you have to go, and definitely worth appreciating. So when you go and enter a tomb, you'll have a list of challenges that'll pop up. Each tomb has its own list of challenges. The good thing is that these are completely optional, but they do give you a pretty good reward, at least within the game. The good thing about this is that the rewards are guaranteed. They're not based off of any random chance or anything like that. And this system actually works very well within the game. And that is because each tomb is repeatable as many times as you like. So you don't have to do all of the challenges all in one go. You can finish one or two at a time, finish the tomb, teleport out, and then run straight back in and do it again. And as you progress through the story, you will start opening up new areas within the hub, which will allow you to access newer tombs as well. And you can actually do that by altering the weather or the season in that entire temple. It's actually part of the main story where Osiris creates a mechanism that can change the weather and the season. So you can have something like a clear sky, sunny sky, or you can have it at nighttime, or you can have heavy rain or heavy snow. Certain areas are locked behind certain weathers. So the best thing for you to do is to explore as much as you can within your current weather condition and then once you're meant to go to the next part of the story where you have to change the weather you can then do it all over again and explore new areas and so by the time you finish the game you would have gotten a hundred percent completion at least in the single player campaign so for the challenges and the puzzles as you start opening up newer locations they'll become more complex and start utilizing different mechanics I have to say I really like the progression of how they increase the complexity of these tombs. It actually feels very natural, and I feel it has to do with the overall length of the game. And since the game is roughly about 5 hours, by the time you get to a point where a mechanic becomes a bit boring or a bit repetitive, they'll introduce something new on top of your existing mechanic to freshen it up a little bit. And apart from all of the main tombs that you have, you also have optional tombs and optional 
combat challenges. So with the optional tombs, there aren't any combat encounters within them, and they focus purely on the puzzles, and they're relatively short. They're not really that difficult either, but they do give you a pretty decent reward at the end, whether it is a maximum HP increase, maximum ammo increase, or giving you a really powerful weapon. On the other hand, the optional combat challenges can be found around the temple hub. Once you interact with the pillar, you'll have tons of enemies that will spawn in waves. And of course, each wave gets progressively more difficult and more enemies spawn. Once you complete it, you'll then be showered with a lot of gems. These combat challenges are repeatable, so you can farm more gems to allow you to open up more chests. But that mechanic of using the gems to open up more chests is potentially the worst part of this game, and really something that has no real tangible reason to exist in this game. So basically, what are these gems, and what are these chests used for? Well, you'll find these chests scattered all across the hub area, and there are also quite a lot of them at the end of a tomb, and every single tomb has quite a lot of them. So once you complete a tomb, you'll then have time to spend your gems to open up chests. There's quite a few variety of them, and they require different amounts of gems to open. The chests have a chance of dropping a random ring or amulet of different quality. So you have your common, jewelry, uncommon, or rare. And these jewelry pieces provide a certain benefit, so something like plus weapon damage, explosion radius, or movement speed. But they also come with a negative effect. So it could be something like you might have plus weapon damage, but negative movement speed or something like that. However, the rare jewelry pieces usually won't have any negative effects, and they'll also have multiple buffs on them, but it does take a bit of grinding to find those. Personally, I actually found myself using the same jewelry that I unlocked very early on in the game when I finished a few of the tomb challenges. And the problem that I have with this mechanic in this game is that the whole gems and chest system reminds me of a mobile game, and its implementation is quite literally like a mobile game. It's a terrible system that kinda aims to arbitrarily add a level of replayability that really has no reason to exist, because it doesn't reward you with something that you know you're gonna get. The reward is completely random. Also, the, the quality of that reward is also random. And not every single game needs to have unlimited replayability. I mean, look at all of the older Tomb Raider games. You finish them once, you finish them properly, and once you have 100% completion, that's it. You are done. You don't need to play that game again. They never should have had this sort of stupid, you know, mobile system mechanic in this game. Instead, what they should have done was to double down and give more incentives to complete the tomb challenges. Because remember, there are already Steam achievements or trophies for completing all of the challenges in each tomb. And these challenges already give you a predetermined or a consistent reward. So you know exactly what you're getting. So you already have the incentivization for doing each of the challenges or multiple incentivizations for doing each of the challenges. The only minor issue I have is that once you're looking at the challenge list, you will see the name of the reward you're going to get. So you might have something like the double barrel shotgun as a reward or, you know, the ring of something, the ring of strength or something. But the thing is, you have no idea what sort of buffs that ring or that gun will provide. The game already has tooltips where when you hover your mouse over a weapon or a jewelry, you'll see what sort of buffs they will provide. And I think it would have been a good thing to include those tooltips on the actual challenge page so that the person knows exactly what they're going to get. But again, as I said before, you don't really need to do any of that grinding or anything like that because the game is pretty easy as it is. If you happen to get a jewelry and it works well for you, you can equip it and pretty much finish the entire game with just your starter gear. Now, for the last part, I wanted to briefly talk about the combat in this game, which is actually something that's very straightforward, but also a lot of fun as well. I wouldn't really say it's revolutionary or anything like that, but I do admit that it is very snappy and very responsive. So basically you have a wide variety of weapons to choose from, and I really mean a quite a wide variety. So Lara will start off with her iconic dual pistols, which just like every other Tomb Raider game, has unlimited ammo and it will be your primary source of damage. 
If you're playing single player, you'll also have the Staff of Osiris, which deals damage in a beam in front of you. It does more of a sustained damage, but to be honest, I never really used it. However, the staff is required to solve puzzles, to move platforms, and that sort of thing. You then have the option of having two secondary weapons. These secondary weapons will all use ammo, which is shown as a blue bar underneath your health bar. Some weapons will use a lot of ammo, but they're far more powerful, like your snipers, your assault rifles, and your shotguns. You then also have weaker weapons, but they also fire faster. So things like your submachine guns or your other varieties of dual pistols like the dual desert eagle that you can use. The good thing is that things like health and ammo have a chance to be dropped by enemies that you defeat. So it's actually a pretty good sort of resource management system where you use and reacquire ammo and health based on your usage. So since I found that I played most of the game just using the standard pistols, and I found that to be more than enough, I wasn't really using my secondary weapons. But once I got my hands on the shotgun and the sniper rifle, they actually consume a lot of ammo, but I was only using them against sort of like the more heavier enemies or the boss enemies, because there is quite a heavy variety of enemies in this game. Most of them, however, can literally just be defeated by shooting at them. There are some that require the use of grenades or some smart mechanic in order to defeat them. Like for example, you have these big skeletons that have a metal shield and they'll deflect all bullets that you fire. But if you put a grenade down and let them walk over it, you detonate the grenade and then you shoot once they are down. The same thing happens with these sort of lizard people where you shoot them a lot, they'll fall on the floor, and then you have to finish them off with a grenade. If you don't do that, they'll basically regenerate and get back up. So overall, I found that the combat was quite responsive and snappy. It would always fire in whichever direction I was shooting, and I could fire and dodge without having that sort of lag in between the two animation states. Not only that, if you're firing in a particular direction, there's a small sort of magnetic effect where you will sort of auto-aim on the enemy if you're firing in that general direction, which I think is good for a game like this. But other than that, I feel that the main core audience for this game are people that are looking for a more casual gaming experience where they want to come in, play for maybe an hour or so, or maybe finish one or two tombs and then sort of, you know, walk away or do something else. The game doesn't require a lot of time investment in order to become really good at the game. The combat mechanics of this game aren't super complex. So anyone with a basic understanding of, you know, playing on PC or even on console will be able to pick it up and thoroughly enjoy this game. And since the story isn't overly complicated for the sake of being complicated, I think that this is one of those games where you can just play it on the side for a little while and just have fun doing it. But because of how sort of casual friendly it is, I wouldn't recommend buying this game at full price. I would recommend getting this game if it's on sale, usually during the Steam summer sale or the any other winter sale that might happen. And that's it for this video. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the game. Let me know what you think of the video. If I can improve in some way, let me know how. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and all of that stuff. And as always, I will see you in the next video.